the people of India would rise to a man and give him a welcome, the like of which has never been seen before or after. The brilliant speeches which he gave all over the country spelt hope and courage. Men everywhere heard these as in a dream. Awake, arise, and stop not till the goal is reached. So long as millions live in hunger and ignorance, I hold every man a traitor who, having been educated at their expense, does nothing for them. Let the new India arise out of the peasants grasping the plow, out of the huts of fishermen, the cobbler, the sweeper. Let her spring from the factory, from hills and mountains. They have suffered eternal misery which has given them unflinching vitality. Give them only half a piece of bread and the whole world will not be big enough to hold their energy. Such was Swami Vivekananda's burning faith in the people, in the future of India. But the Swami was exerting himself too much. The sands were running out. Did he have a prevision of his coming end? On May the 1st, 1897, he called a meeting of the monastic order and the lay devil. He reached America, the land of hope and liberty and the venue of the Parliament of Religions in Chicago. On inquiry, he came to know that the Parliament of Religions would not be meeting till September. And as he had no references or credentials from a recognized organization, he could not be enlisted as a delegate. But completely alone and without any resources, he was finding it hard to cope with Chicago's high cost of living. He decided to go to Boston, which was cheaper. In Boston, he stayed as a guest of Miss Kate Sanborn. And it was there that he met Professor John Henry Wright of Harvard University. Professor Wright was so impressed that he insisted that Swami Vivekananda should represent Hinduism at the Parliament of Religions at Chicago. I have no credentials, replied the Swami. Professor Wright was surprised at this, and he said, To ask you, Swami, for your credentials is like asking the sun about its right to shine. On his own, Professor Wright gave him a letter of introduction to the president of the committee, the Parliament of Religions. In that letter, he wrote, He is more learned than all our learned professors put together. Vivekananda reached Chicago from Boston late in the evening. His troubles were not yet over. On the way, he had lost the address of the office of the committee for the Parliament of Religions. And he had no money. Unable to find any other way of passing the night, he stayed like this in a boxcar in the railroad freight yard. He walked along Chicago's fashionable Lake Shore Drive. Hungry and weary, he knocked at several doors, but these would not open. Completely worn out, he at last sits down on the sidewalk, not knowing which way to turn. And then, suddenly his luck turned. From a window on the other side of the road, a lady saw him. Excuse me, are you a delegate to the Parliament of Religion? The good lady was Mrs. George W. Hale. She looked after his needs and later took him to the office of the Parliament of Religions. The Parliament of Religions opened on September the 11th, 1893. On the opening day, the Hall of Columbus was packed to the full. On the dais sat some of the best-known representatives of world faiths. Practiced orators, they all spoke eloquently about their own faith. At first, Vivekananda felt a little nervous. Silent and prayerful, he sat, the observed of all observers. It was in the afternoon that Vivekananda first addressed the Congress and through it, the world. After a short prayer to Saraswati, the goddess of speech, he started to speak. The words came, words that would soon go round the world. He began, Sisters and brothers of America, and brothers of America, sisters and brothers of America. A spontaneous clapping filled the house. The applause went on and on and on. The audience had never heard anything like this before.
sisters and brothers of America, I thank you in the name of the most ancient order of monks of the world. I thank you in the name of the mother of all religions. I thank you in the name of millions and millions of Hindu people of all classes and sects. I am proud to belong to a religion which has taught the world both tolerance and universal acceptance. We believe not only in universal toleration, but we accept all religions as true. Here are a few lines which are repeated every day by millions in my country. As the different streams reach the sea, the different paths that men take through their different tendencies all lead but to thee. It did not matter what else he said. The audience was at his feet. Vivekananda had come. Distinguished delegates. Distinguished delegates to the world's parliament of religions, ladies and gentlemen, Welcome to the afternoon session of the opening day today, the 11th of September, 1893. We now introduce you to Swami Vivekananda from India and request him to address us. Swami Vivekananda. Sisters and brothers of America. It fills my heart with joy unspeakable to rise in response to the warm and cordial welcome which you have given us. I thank you in the name of the most ancient order of monks in the world. I thank Challenge in the inner world of values, even more than in the outer. It was a period of clash and confusion when the fate of the nation hung in the balance. Would India perish? Among the many figures that rose to meet that challenge and set the balance right, none was more vehement. None more of Vivekananda, the greatest of the, the spirit with the widest wings. A grateful nation gave its full and frank verdict of veneration for the saint and the savior. So also the rent. For though India was the apparent theme of all or most of his labor, Vivekananda's vision easily overflew all narrow national and sectarian boundaries. A truly universal man. His vision applies equally well to the human situation. And if the crisis of civilization through which we are passing has to end, this may be the only way out, the way of the spirit and the way of harmony. It is only natural to wish to know something of this noble and remarkable career, profound and paradoxical, modern and ageless, of a rishi and a revolutionary. One soul's ambition lifted up the race. He drew energies that transmute an age. He made great dreams a mold for coming things and cast his deeds like bronze to front the years. This is Pamban, South India, where Swami Vivekananda set foot on the Indian soil after his triumphant tour of the West. This was on the 26th of January. 1897, a vast crowd waiting patiently to welcome the national hero, all of them waiting to pay their homage to Swami Vivekananda, the patriot saint, the first mighty voice of awakened India. 
Among them was the Raja of Ramnad, Bhaskar Setupati, with his state coach, ready to receive the royal ascetic. It was a hero's welcome indeed. It was indeed a memorable occasion. The Raja himself the throne. Here he comes, defender of the faith, darling child of India, India awakened. Swami was quite overwhelmed, but he took it with dignity, with humility. At night, there was a torchlight procession, and then fireworks. In reply, the Swami said, This grand reception is made not unto a military general or a politician, a prince or a millionaire, but to a poor, penniless sannyasin. This shows the spirituality of India. This shows wherein lies the vitality of our nation. After the grand reception in the South, the Swami left for Calcutta, his hometown, where a grand reception was given to him. From there he began a series of inspiring speeches all over the country. My India, arise. The longest night seems to be passing away. Awake from this hypnotism of weakness. Stand up and assert yourself. Proclaim the God within you. Religion alone is the life of this country. When that goes, India will die. In spite of politics, in spite of social reforms, in spite of everything. Each soul is potentially divine. The goal is to manifest the divinity within all of us. Do it either by work or worship, by psychic control or philosophy, by one or more or all of these, and be free. This is the whole of religion. Doctrines or dogmas, rituals, books, temples, forms are but secondary details. In all his speeches, nothing was so touching and so revolutionary as his wide and natural sympathy for the poor and the fallen. Do you feel that millions and millions of descendants of gods and sages have become next-door neighbors to brutes? Do you feel that millions are starving today and millions have been starving for ages? Your ancestors have written a few philosophical works, penned a dozen or so epics, or built a number of temples. That is all and you rend the sky with triumphal shouts, while those whose heart's blood has contributed to all the progress that has ever been made in the world, well, who cares to praise them? Ye ever trample laboring classes of India, I bow to thee. For the next 50 years, let all other vain gods disappear from our minds. This is the only God that is awake, our own race. The first God that we have to serve and worship are our own people. Everywhere his hand, everywhere his feet. He covers everything. Sarvatokshi shiro mukham sarvata shutimalloke Faith. Faith in ourselves. If you have faith in the 330 millions of mythological gods 
and still have no faith in yourselves, there is no salvation for you. Let us all work hard, brethren. This is no time to sleep. On our work depends the coming of the India of the future. Where and how did this remarkable life begin? One is naturally curious to know, and this is a good time to remember. It was here in the city of Calcutta that Swami Vivekanand or Narendra Nath was born on the 12th of January, 1863. Not far from the holy river Ganga, in this house and its neighborhood, the boy Naren used to play as a child like other children. His father, Sri Vishwanath Datta, was an attorney of the Calcutta High Court, well versed in Persian and English literature, but typical of his time his father was indifferent to the Indian cultural heritage. But his mother, Srimati Bhuvaneshwari Devi, belonged to the old Hindu tradition. Religious by temperament, she would often read to the boy tales from the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. This was the seed of spiritual life sown early in Narayan's mind. His boyish imagination was fired by these tales of heroic idealism. Ram Chandra going to the forest in exile renouncing his kingdom to keep up the promise of his father. Jitayu, the eagle king's self-sacrifice to rescue Sita. Bharat's devotion to his brother in exile. Krishna and Arjun in the battle of Kurukshetra. Mother of the universe, goddess Durga. One day he purchased a little image and took it quietly up into the attic. A frantic search was made for the missing lad, when at last he was discovered here, sitting, self-absorbed, before his Ishta, chosen deity. Those days, in gentlemen's homes, one would come across these separate hookahs, or hubba bubbles, for the different castes and for the Hindus and the Muslims. Naren was curious, and one day he took some whiffs from the hookah marked for people of the lower caste. Then he tried, one after the other, the hookah for the Brahmins and the hookah for the non-Brahmins. Men are all alike. Then why are their hookahs different? Thought the young ascetic. What are you doing there, Naren? Oh, Father, I'm just trying to find out how one loses caste. But I can't really find any difference. Oh, you devil! So the boy grew up into a brave and brilliant, intellectually alert young man. Reverend Hasty, the principal of his college, who had taught Norin, had this to say about him. I have traveled far and wide, but I have never yet come across a lad of his talents and possibilities. He is bound to make a mark in life. Words that would one day come true. In his student life, he came in contact with the Western intellectual tradition through the works of Kant, Hegel, Hume, and Herbert Spencer, to whom he had once written a letter. The scientific ideas and nihilistic thoughts of Western thinkers shook to their foundation the religious beliefs he had inherited. They raised such a tumult in his mind that he despaired of any final answer. Raja Ram Mohan Rai, the founder of Brahmo Samaj, had broken away from the rituals, the image worship and the priestcraft of orthodox Hinduism. As an intellectually alive young person, Norin could not but be interested. He had joined the Samaj partly because of his sympathy with its program of social reforms. But this did not satisfy his deeper spiritual yearnings. Of a strong, positive cast of mind, he wanted to see the truth, face to face, and not merely hear talks about it. In those days, Keshav Chandra Sen was a renowned orator and religious leader of the Samaj. There were also men like Vijay Krishna Goswami, Shivnath Shastri and others. They all spoke of a merciful God and delivered sermons learned and beautiful to hear. But Norin's hunger remained. The doubts lingered still. Does God really exist? 
If so, has he form? Or is he formless? Can he be seen? How? In his agony and despair, Norin went round the leaders of different sects in the city and its suburbs. He had a single and straight question. Have you seen God? Have you seen God? Have you seen God? But none could answer. At last he thought of going to Maharshi Devendranath Thakur, the venerable leader of the Brahma Samaj. Narendranath was then staying in a houseboat on the Ganga. There went Narendranath unannounced. At the time, the Maharshi was in deep meditation.